Hello, everybody. Thanks for coming out tonight. Um, I'm Alan Drew, the director of the Literary Festival. And uh, again, thank you all for coming out. It's a pretty good turnout, so it's great to see you all. Can you hear me all right? Yes. All right. Um, we're very excited tonight to have Dale Obrecht here uh, to read from a wonderful book, Tiger's Wife. Um, just going to read for a little while, then maybe a Q&A afterwards, so have your questions ready, please. And uh, then we've got books in the back, and she's agreed to stick around and sign a few. So if you don't have this book already, go ahead and pick it up and uh, come back in the back and get some fruit or some brownies, and then uh, and get your book signed. Um, for those of you who don't know, do not know, the Literary Festival reading series is attached to a course called the Literary Festival Workshop. Um, students in that course read the works from the authors and poets that are, that are visiting um, throughout the semester. And then they have a chance to sit down and uh, in the classroom and have a Q&A with, an informal Q&A with the author, which is exactly what happened today. Um, two students from the course will be giving the introductions today. Um, so before I turn it over to Mary Grace Mangano and Sarah Chowdhury, I have to, uh, I have to go ahead and thank a few people for uh, all their help in, in get, keeping this uh, festival going. Um, the first is College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, the English department and all the faculty. Uh, without the faculty having the students read the work and, have, and asking them to come out to the festival would be, you know, be really difficult to, to put this thing on. So thanks, thank you to all the English faculty. Um, Irish Studies Department, the Gender and Women's Studies uh, Department, Africana Studies, the Honors Program, Falby Library, Villanova Writing Center, and the Modern Language and Literature Department. Um, and of course, I need, to, I need to thank Dr. Martha Sewell, with whom I teach the Literary Festival Workshop course, and she's the person that actually got this whole thing started in the first place. Um, and Afton Woodward, who is in the back selling books, she, uh, she's the one that makes everything actually, she connects all the dots. I just throw things on her, she, she gets things done. So without her, this would probably all fall apart. And I just want to thank the students in the class who have been wonderful this semester. Um, it's been really great to teach the course. And uh, lastly, we have one more event for this year's series. Um, that is on April 26th here in the cinema at 7 o'clock. It's William Kennedy, the Pulitzer Prize winning author, who will be coming down from Albany. Um, he read his new book. Um, so please come back out then and have some more brownies and book signs and all that good stuff. Um, and we are on Facebook. Um, so if you're on Facebook and you enjoy being here tonight, please go ahead and like us, please, so we feel good about ourselves. Um, actually, it's just a way, it's actually helpful, it's a way for us to get the word out about events, um, so we get more people on and more people can we can reach. And uh, I guess that's it for me, so here's Sarah and Mary Grace. We are honored to have Taya Obred at Villanova tonight. Though she is only 26 years old, she has made her mark on the literary world and has impressed readers and critics with her masterful storytelling and fluid, beautiful prose. Ms. Obreth was born in Belgrade, but left the Balkans when she was seven, as civil war broke out in the region. She has lived in Cyprus and Egypt and moved to the United States when she was 12. Ms. Obreth graduated from the University of Southern California and received her MFA from Cornell. Ms. Obreth has had one of the most impressive literary debuts in recent history with the publication of her first novel, The Tiger's Wife. She has won the 2011 Orange Prize and became the youngest novelist to ever win this prestigious prize. She has received numerous accolades for her work and has been named one of the best 20 writers under 40 by the New Yorker and one of the best five writers under 35 by the National Book Foundation. Her writing has appeared in the New Yorker, Harper's, The Atlantic, and The New York Times. Her work has also been anthologized in the Best American Short Stories and the Best American Non-Required Reading. Her first novel has been widely praised as hugely ambitious and audaciously written by the New York Times and Publishers Weekly has written, Ms. Obrecht is talented far beyond her years and her unsentimental faith in language, dream, and memory is a pleasure. The Tiger's Wife effortlessly blends together the past and present as a young doctor named Natalia comes to terms with her beloved grandfather's death in a war-torn region. The novel weaves together evocative myths and legends such as, that of the such as that of the deathless man, the nephew of death who works to shepherd the recently departed to the next life. Readers have become fascinated by the no novel's title character, the deaf mute girl who befriends a tiger who escaped from, a from the zoo during World War II. The Tiger's Wife is a remarkable novel that has enthralled readers across the world. I first read The Tiger's Wife last summer. I had seen the New York Times review of the novel, and it was on Barnes & Noble's Books Were Talking About list. I was intrigued by the summary, and after reading the first few pages, I made a beeline to the register and bought the book. 
I began reading it on my lunch breaks. Every day, I would pray that the morning shift of my internship would go more quickly so that I could grab my lunch and the tiger's wife and head to the bench by the river. Sometimes, my lunch sat half forgotten on the bench beside me as I devoured the book instead. There was something about Natalia, her grandfather, the deathless man, all of these incredibly real and evocative characters that consumed me. I wanted to know more about them, all about them, and at the same time, I didn't want the story to end. Natalia's relationship with her grandfather is so special, and it seemed familiar to me. I found it extremely curious that Natalia had to learn such important details about someone who had raised her by piecing together stories from people of his village. Yet the idea that even those we know well are mysteries to us is completely valid. The story is so beautifully woven together, like a cherished patchwork quilt passed down through generations. The plot of The Tiger's Wife is tremendously rich and complex. The characters are well-developed and fascinating. Obert's descriptive language and ability to create a fully realized image are remarkable, placing the reader directly in the action of the story. The hint of magical realism that runs throughout the novel enthralled me and caused me to forget my lunch sitting on the bench beside me and to arrive almost late to my internship's afternoon shift. Having reread the novel for class this semester, I know this is a story I will read and reread again and again. I was struck once more by the magic and imagination in this story, which makes the lives of the characters, though riddled with grief and destruction, war and violence, somehow magnificent and wonderful. And I'm sure every time I enter the lives of Natalia, Baba Ivan, Luca, and Dr. Stefanovic, that I will discover new knowledge, becoming fully immersed in the beautiful, dark, and mysterious world of Gavron Gallet, Jerisha the Bear, and that enchantress, the Tiger's Wife. Wow, thank you so much um, for those wonderful introductions, Sarah and Mary Grace, um, and uh, uh, Alan as well. I, uh, I don't think I can follow it up now, so I'm just going to stand here and grin for the next 30, 30 minutes. Um, I, wow, this is kind of, okay, I can't quite, sorry. At every, at every podium, it's sort of like a different coordination. You don't quite know. Um, am I online, by the way, with the little speaker? Little thing? Okay. Um, so thank you, thank you all for uh, for having me here at, at Villanova, and thank you for uh, thank you for being here tonight. Um, I uh, so you got so much of my biography, so there goes the first five minutes of my of my general <laughs> intro. Uh, but I'll stretch it out. Don't worry. Um, I uh, I was born in the Balkans, um, as uh, as you've uh, as you've heard, and um, I. Um, I ended up at the University of Southern California by way of Cyprus and Egypt and sort of this like wild, ridiculous childhood that I still haven't properly appreciated, um, being an ungrateful daughter and granddaughter that I am. Um, I, um, well, I was in, when I was in Los Angeles, I sort of decided uh, firmly that I wanted to write and um, applied for an MFA at Cornell and sort of found out that I'd gotten in and this was very, very exciting news for me. And um, uh, I was getting ready to go there and my grandfather, whom, with whom I was very, very close, um, died uh, quite suddenly. He had been, uh, he had he'd, he'd gotten cancer and there was sort of like a good prognosis and then there was no prognosis, um, as is so often the case. And uh, it was, you know, it was this graduation of my senior year and, and I was sort of, devastated and horrified. It was the first person in my life who'd, who'd passed away, um, ever. And, uh, you know, grieved sort of for the appropriate amount of time and, and, you know, trying to cope with it in different ways and thought, well, this must be, this must be the right way to, to deal with this. And um, uh, I had this, you know, life as, a, as an attempting writer that was coming up and I was like, well, I'll just, I'll go and, and uh, make the best of it I can and hopefully that'll, you know, hopefully that'll be okay. And, and I had this you know, wonderful thing to look forward to, and he would have wanted me to look forward to it. Um, and, uh, you know, moving, moving to upstate New York from Los Angeles was, you know, just great. <laughs> it's great. Um, I, uh, I, was, I was excited about it. I was like, oh, there'll be seasons, you know, like the leaves will turn and like snow will fall. It will, it will be epic. And um, I, uh, so I got there, and, and I had this sort of fantasy about what like life as a writer was going to look like. I was like, I'll be like living in my little apartment by myself, like, and uh, late in the night I will make hot cocoa and write and write and write, and it'll be great. 
And um, you know, the seasons came and the seasons went and it was like fall and I was like, wow, it's all red and gold. It's wonderful. I feel so writerly. And uh, then, then winter came and I was like, wow, it's beautiful. It's white and puffy and like, it'll be wonderful. And then after like the third time, third or fourth time, I, I dug up the wrong car under a snow pile because because it like uh, when you do the first when you do the test scratch you know it's like it's like the right color but you don't test scratch the license plate and then you end up some, like digging up somebody else's Ford Focus or like somebody else's Nissan and you're like no oh, this 45 minutes of my life and I was like oh I'm over seasons you know I'd like to go back to LA now send me home um, and uh, I was, you know, I, I sort of consoled myself by, by locking myself into my little subterranean apartment, which was also very conducive for, for seasons because it was, it was subterranean, literally subterranean. And you would, you know, you would stand sort of underground. And then the, um, the window was at waist level. So as the snow fell, you could watch the outside world slowly disappearing through this like hourglass of sadness and despair. So more conducive for writing. But instead of writing, I watched television, uh, a lot of it. Um, and uh, saw this episode about Siberian tigers uh, on National Geographic. They were running like a big cat week special um, for those of us who are super nerdy like me. And um, I, uh, I, I, you know, watched the episode. It was about this Russian researcher who kept two semi-captive Siberian tigers in this enclosure, and he's he's like raised them since cubhood, and and he knew all kinds of things about tigers. I don't know anymore. And um, he had, a, he had a wife uh, who lived with him out near this enclosure, and she was able to reduce these really, really massive enraged cats into like purring kittens just with the sound of her voice. And, um, I wrote this short story in which a, a young deaf mute girl uh, befriends uh, uh, her, comes to, a, befriends a young boy in a, in a Balkan village. Um, uh, while she's pursuing her escaped circus tiger. It's like, wow, where did these Balkans come from? I've never written about this, but it has nothing to do with my grandfather's death. And, um, and the short story was terrible, and it got absolutely wrecked in a workshop, I mean, in every possible way. I thought that it was just, like, it was, I was like, so excited that it was doing something new, and it turned out to be like a horrible, horrible short story with all kinds of errors. And I remember um, one of my colleagues in the workshop just saying, um, you know, this is a short story that has pitchfork wielding rabble in it, like pitchfork wielding peasantry, and yet it is not Frankenstein. What is up with that? And I was like, I don't know. So um, the story is now totally devoid of pitchforks and pitchfork wielding rabble. Like they, they're not in there anymore. Like maybe there's some torches and stuff, but not uh, not pitchforks. Um, but I was attached to the characters and I was attached to the storyline and and. Um, I, I kept going with it, and, and at first it was like 35 pages. I was like, well, if I write a little bit more, like maybe I can disperse this garbage that's here on the page. And uh, then at like 60 pages, I was like, well, this is interesting. It's better now because it's just sort of diluted with some good stuff around it. So that's that's okay. And then at like 80 pages, I was like, oh my god, I think I think I might be writing a novel. And this was a very strange experience because there had there you know. You had thought that your novel writing experience was going to have quite a bit of fanfare to it. There, you know, there had there had been this, this assumption that you were going to decide one day, like one glorious day, that you were going to be a novel writer, and that was it. You know, your life was sealed, and you would go off and have you know write wonderful adventure novel stories, and everybody would be really excited for you. But in reality, it was this like horrifying private moment where it was like, oh my God, this is only the beginning. It's eighty pages long, and it's only the beginning. Um, and a lot of it changed since then, um, but not the section that I'm going to read to you now, uh, which is the opening of the book, the very beginning. Uh, and it goes like this. In my earliest memory, my grandfather is bald as a stone, and he takes me to see the tigers. He puts on his hat, his big buttoned raincoat, and I wear my lacquered shoes and velvet dress. It is autumn, and I am four years old. The certainty of this process, my grandfather's hand, the bright hiss of the trolley, the dampness of the morning, the crowded walk up the hill to the Citadel Park. Always in my grandfather's breast pocket, the jungle book with its gold leaf cover and old yellow pages. I am not allowed to hold it, but it will stay open on his knee all afternoon while he recites the passages to me. Even though my grandfather is not wearing his stethoscope or white coat, 
The lady at the ticket counter in the entrance shed calls him doctor. Then there is the popcorn cart, the umbrella stand, a small kiosk with postcards and pictures. Down the stairs and past the aviary where the sharp-eared owls sleep, through the garden that runs the length of the citadel wall framed with cages. Once there was a king here, a sultan, his janissaries. Now the cannon windows facing the street hold blocked off troughs filled with tepid water. The cage bars curve out, rusted orange. In his free hand, my grandfather is carrying the blue bag my grandma has prepared for us. In it, six-day-old cabbage heads for the hippopotamus, carrots and celery for the sheep and deer, and the bull moose, who is a kind of phenomenon. In his pocket, my grandfather has hidden some sugar cubes for the pony that pulls the park carriage. I will not remember this as sentimentality, but as greatness. The tigers live in the outer moat of the fortress. We climb the castle stairs, past the water birds and the sweating windows of the monkey house, past the wolf growing his winter coat. We pass the bearded vultures and then the bears, asleep all day, smelling of damp earth and the death of something. My grandfather picks me up and props my feet against the handrail so I can look down and see the tigers in the moat. My grandfather never refers to the tiger's wife by name. His arm is around me and my feet are on the handrail and my grandfather might say, I once knew a girl who loved tigers so much she almost became one herself. Because I am little, and my love of tigers comes directly from him, I believe he is talking about me, offering me a fairy tale in which I can imagine myself and will for years. The cages face a courtyard, and we go down the stairs and walk slowly from cage to cage. There is a panther, too, ghost spots paling his oil slick coat a sleepy, bloated lion from Africa. But the tigers are awake and livid, bright with rancor. Stripe-lashed shoulders rolling, they flank one another up and down the narrow causeway of rock, and the smell of them is sour and warm and fills everything. It will stay with me the whole day, even after I have had my bath and gone to bed, and will return at random times, at school, at a friend's birthday party, even years later, at the pathology lab or in the drive home from Galena. I remember this, too, an altercation. A small group of people stand clustered around the tiger's cage. Among them, a boy with a parrot-shaped balloon, a woman in a purple coat, and a bearded man who is wearing the brown uniform of a zookeeper. The man has a broom and a dustpan on a long handle, and he is sweeping the area between the cage and the outer railing. He walks up and down, sweeping up juice boxes and candy wrappers, bits of popcorn people have tried to throw at the tigers. The tigers walk up and down with him. The woman in purple is saying something and smiling, and he smiles back at her. She has brown hair. The dustpan keeper stops and leans against the handle of his broom, and as he does so, the bigger of the two tigers sweeps by, rubbing against the bars of the cage, rumbling and the keeper puts a hand through the bars and touches its flank. For a moment, nothing. And then pandemonium. The tiger rounds on him, and the woman shrieks, and suddenly the dustpan keeper's shoulder is between the bars, and he is twisting, twisting his head away and trying to reach for the outer railing so that he has something to hold on to. The tiger has the dustpan keeper's arm the way a dog holds a large bone, upright between its paws gnawing on the top. Two men, who have been standing by with children, jump over the railing and grab the dustpan keeper's waist and flailing arm and try to pull him away. A third man jams his umbrella through the bars and pushes it over and over again into the tiger's ribs. An outraged scream from the tiger, and then it stands up on its hind legs and hugs the dustpan keeper's arm and shakes its head from side to side like it's pulling on rope. Its ears are flattened, and it is making a noise like a locomotive. The dustpan keeper's face is white, and this entire time, he hasn't made a sound. Then suddenly, it's no longer worth it, and the tiger lets go. The three men fall away, and there's a splatter of blood. The tiger is lashing its tail, and the dustpan keeper is crawling under the outer railing and standing up. The woman in purple has vanished. She's vanished.
The woman in purple has vanished. My grandfather has not turned away. I am four years old, but he has not turned me away either. I see it all, and later there is the fact that he wants me to have seen. Then the dustpan keeper is hurrying our way, winding a piece of torn shirt across his arm. He is red-faced and angry on his way to the infirmary. At the time, I believe this is fear, but later I will know it as shame. The tigers, agitated, are lunging back and forth across the grate. The keeper is leaving a dark trail on the gravel behind him. As he passes us, my grandfather says, my God, you're a fool, aren't you? And the man says something in reply, something I know not to repeat. Instead, shrill and self-righteous in my lacquered boots, brave because my grandfather is holding my hand, I say, he's a fool, isn't he, Grandpa? But my grandfather is already walking after the dustpan keeper, pulling me along, calling for the man to stop so he can help him. Um, so that's the beginning of the book. Uh, I'm sorry, two of my pages got stuck together and I was like, doo, doo, doo. Um, <laughs> stay with me. Uh, I, um, so, I mean, the, the book underwent a, a great deal of changes and, and sort of many iterations and different drafts. Um, and uh, this was helped in part by the, or helped or not helped, um, in part by the, by the fact that um, towards the end of the second draft, uh, I was sent to Serbia and Croatia by Harper's Magazine on a vampire hunting mission. That's right. Um, I, was, <laughs> I was sent to gather stories of vampire lore from uh, the Balkans where vampire lore actually originated. And I don't know if you've noticed, but apparently uh, like I've heard about some sort of um, trend towards vampires here in the West. Like I haven't really gotten wind of it, but they tell me it's here. Like you, you might have heard of Twilight, Twilight, Twi, Twilight, other things. Um, so th there's, a, there's you know there's a huge interest in vampires, and and uh, in the Balkans they're sort of um, they're quite different than 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 they are here. I mean here it's sort of this like this like sexy tortured soul, and in the Balkans it's like we didn't bury him properly. He's in the backyard now. He's walking. Um, <laughs> no. Um, and uh, it's, it's sort of a very different sentiment towards, uh, towards the, the vampire creature. And um, this, uh, this involved a lot of uh, going door to door um, in, in sort of villages that had no name and were not on any map and, and uh, knocking on, door on strangers' doors and being like, hi, we don't have an appointment and you don't know me, but um, would you like to talk about the village vampire? And uh, this is a request that is apparently typically met with one of two reactions, either you are you know, either the door is slammed in your face and you are knocked backwards off the stoop immediately, or you hear, oh yes, of course, come on in, and you're invited in for like massive amounts of very hard liquor called rakia, which sort of has the same effect as drinking like, like antifreeze. Um, and, uh, and then you're regaled with uh, improbable tales that get more and more improbable as there's less and less rakia in the bottle. Um, and during the course of this, Sort of, I have a different understanding now of Balkan lore. Um, let me go back and annoy my editor by rewriting like 120 pages of this book in the last stage, ah! um, which I didn't go over so well at the time, but uh, it greatly improved the book. Um, and sort of meandered in uh, into one of the stories that uh, the grandfather tells Natalia. Um, so this is a, a, a section of, uh, of, of one of those stories. Um, Natalia is piecing together her grandfather's life um, based on, on the experiences they shared and, and the things he told her about his life before she was born. Um, this is from the grandfather's perspective. I have tried previously to do like an elderly gentleman in his 70s kind of voice and it really didn't pan out so good. So um, even though this is first, pers point, fir first person point of view uh, from the grandfather, um, I'm not going to do the voice, so you'll have to you'll have to imagine that I'm I am such a man that I'm such a distinguished elderly gentleman. Here I go. This is late summer, '54, not '55, because that's the year I met your grandma. I am first triage assistant for the battalion, and my apprentice, God rest him, or intern, as you would call it is this brilliant little Hungarian fellow who has paid a lot of money to study at our university, but who doesn't speak a word of the language. 
God knows why he's not in Paris or London. He's that apt at Pascal. He's not apt at much else, though. At any rate, a call comes in from this village where there's been a sickness. Some people have died, and those still living are afraid. There is a terrible cough and blood on their pillows in the morning. This is about as mysterious to me as an empty milk saucer when there's a big fat cat in the room and the cat has a ring of milk on its whiskers and everyone is asking where the milk is. So we hitch a wagon ride to this village. The man who greets us is called Madik. He is the son of the big man in town and has been to university. He is the man who sent the wire asking us to come. He is short and stocky and he leads us through the village and into his father's house. Madik's sister is this fat, pleasant-looking woman, very much what you'd expect. She gives us coffee and bread with cheese, which is a nice change from all that porridge we've been eating back at the barracks. Then Madik says, gentlemen, something new is at hand. I expect he will say, the epidemic's gotten worse. More death, mass hysteria. I'm partly right, especially about the hysteria. Apparently, this is how it stands. A man has died, and there has been a funeral. At the funeral, this man, who is called Gavo, sits up in his coffin and asks for water. It is an immense surprise. Three o'clock in, in the afternoon, the procession is following the casket up the churchyard slope to the plot. First, there's the noise of the body sliding in the coffin, and when the lid comes off, there he is, this man Gavo, as pale and blue-faced as the day they found him floating belly up in a pond some way from town. He sits up in his pressed suit, hat in hand, folded purple napkin in his pocket. An immense surprise. High up, held aloft in his coffin like a man in a boat, he looks around the procession with red eyes and says, water. That is all. By the time the pallbearers have realized what's happened, by the time they've dropped the coffin and fled like crazy men into the church, this man has already fallen back into the casket. That is what Madik tells us regarding this new development. From where we are sitting in Madik's house, I can see out the open door and down the road leading across the field and through the churchyard. I have only just noticed that the town is very empty and that at the door of the little church there is a man with a pistol, the undertaker, Madik tells me, who hasn't slept for six days. I am already thinking it would be far more productive to help this man, the undertaker. Meanwhile, Madik is still telling the story and in it the man Gavo does not rise from his coffin again. This is helped by the fact that some unknown member of the funeral procession fires two bullets from an army pistol into the back of his head while he is sitting up in the coffin right after the pallbearers drop it. Never mind why someone is so very prepared to fire a gun at a funeral. Madik only tells us this part of the story after he has had two or three glasses of plum brandy. I am taking notes this whole time and wondering about how this gavo ties into the sickness I am there to treat. When Madik mentions the two bullets, I put my pencil down and say, so the man was not dead. No, no, Madik says, most assuredly he was dead. Before the bullets were fired, I ask him because it seems to me that this whole business is taking a different route and now they're just making things up to cover murder. Madik shrugs and says, it is a surprise, I know. I continue to write, but what I'm writing does not make much sense. And Maddox looks with interest across the table and reads what I am writing upside down. My assistant, who I suspect has not understood any of this, is staring intently at me for some sort of explanation. I say, we will have to see the body. Maddox's hands are on the table and I can see that he is a man who bites his nails when he is nervous. He has been biting them a lot recently. He says to me, are you sure that's necessary? We will have to see it. I don't know about that, doctor. I've been making a list of all the people I want to speak with, anyone who is sick, all the family members of this revenant fellow, Gavo, and especially the priest and undertaker who are most likely to know about his condition before he was shot. I say to Madik, many people are at risk here if the man was sick. He was not sick. I'm sorry, he was perfectly healthy. My assistant is looking in abject confusion from Madik to myself. He has known me long enough to process that the expression on my face is probably not one of delight, and he is obviously puzzled by what is going on. Madik himself doesn't look too good either. I say, very well then, I will tell you how I see it. As far as the village goes, including Mr. Gavo himself, I am confident that my findings will probably arrive at a diagnosis of consumption, tuberculosis. 
It is consistent with the symptoms you've described to me, the bloody cough and so forth. I would like to have all the people who are sick assembled in your town hospital as quickly as possible, and I would like to place the town under quarantine until we can assess the extent of the illness. And here, he catches me off guard because he says sharply, what do you mean tuberculosis? He looks very distraught, and I would expect him to be distraught at tuberculosis, but I would expect a different kind of alarm. The way he looks at me, I feel like my diagnosis doesn't suit him, like it's inadequate, not severe enough. He says, couldn't it be something else? I tell him, no, not with these symptoms, not with people falling dead one by one and leaving bloody pillows behind. I assure him that it will be all right, that I will send out for medicine, for nurses, another city physician to help me. He asks, what if it doesn't help? I tell him it will. If it's tuberculosis, he says, if you're right. I'm not entirely certain where this is going. What if you're wrong, he says, what if it's something else? By this time, he is very agitated and he says, I don't think you understand, sir. I really doubt you understand. I ask him to tell me about it. Well, says Marek, there is blood on our pillows and there was blood on the lapels of Gabo's coat. Because you shot him. Marek almost falls out of his seat. I didn't shoot him, doctor. He was already dead. I am scribbling again, mostly just to look official. My assistant is sweating in frustration. I say, I will need to speak with his family. He has no family. He's not from around here. He was some sort of peddler from far away. We didn't know anything about him. We wanted to do right by burying him here. To me, this is becoming more and more frustrating, but I think maybe that is why they're all suddenly coming down with tuberculosis. Maybe he was infected and brought it in, even though he seemed perfectly healthy to them. But then, he has only been here for a short time, certainly not enough to get the whole village sick, but obviously long enough for them to shoot him in the back of the head. Who will give me permission, I ask, to dig up the body? You don't need it. Marek is wringing his hands. We nail the coffin shut, and then we put him in the church. He's still in there. I look through the door again, and sure enough, there's the undertaker standing at the church door, pistol in hand, just in case. I see you. No, Marek says, he is almost crying, and he is wringing his hat furiously in his hands. My assistant has all but given up. Marek says, you don't see. People with blood on their clothes are sitting up in coffins. And then there is blood on our pillows in the morning. I don't believe you see at all. So there we are, my assistant and I, standing at the little stone church in Bistrina. The coffin of the man called Gabo is there, lying at an angle from the door as if it's been shoved in pretty quickly. It's a dusty wooden coffin. The church is stone and quiet. It smells of sandalwood and wax, and there is an icon of the Virgin above the door. The windows are blue glass. It is a beautiful church, but it is obvious that no one has been in it for a long time. The candles are all out, and this fellow's coffin is covered with a few spatters of white, which the doves that live in the belfry have been dropping down on him. It is a sad thing to see, because as far as I know, this man has done nothing to deserve being shot in the back of the head at his own funeral twice. After we come in, the undertaker slams the door behind us quickly and suddenly, and for a long time everything is quiet in the little church. We come in with our satchels, and we also brought a crowbar to open the coffin, and we begin to think that perhaps we should have brought in more than just the crowbar, a team of oxen, for example, because the coffin has not only been nailed shut, but also crisscrossed with extra boards across the lid and chained around and around with what looks like a bicycle chain. Someone, probably as an afterthought, has thrown a string of garlic onto the coffin, and the heads are lying there in their paper shape. My assistant manages to say to me, shame, all the shame. Then he spits and says, and then we hear something that is altogether incredible, something you cannot even begin to appreciate, because without hearing for yourself the way it sounded in the quiet church, you won't believe it happened. It is the sound of shuffling movement, and then, all of a sudden, a voice from the coffin, a frank, polite, slightly muffled voice, says, water. Thank you. Um, so that is, that is sort of the extent of, uh, of my reading. Um, I don't like to sort of go on and on and on from up here, so I'm happy to take um, questions from the audience, which I always find to be the most amazing part of the reading. Or I could sing a song. <laughs>
Thank you. <laughs> now, what are you working on now? What am I working on now? Um, I, uh, well, I, um, it took a really long time to get sort of the, the gist of another novel going, um, but it's happened. Thank you. Um, and uh, I'm looking forward to, I've been on tour since last March, so I haven't had much time to just settle down and, and write, and I'm sort of a very solitary, very focused, very crazy writer. Um, and uh, I, um, so it'll be a novel, hopefully. Uh, and hopefully, starting, starting April 22nd, I'm off tour, so I'll be writing then. We'll see what happens. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, the pouches that the, that the diggers have? They're sort of, um, they're, they're talismans with herbs in them that are intended to, uh, in the Balkans, there's a, a little bit of backstory. In the Balkans, there is um, a real superstition about witches, about magic women. Um, and it tends to be sort of in the eastern part of Serbia. Um, and it's called Vlaška Magia, which is, which is actually Wallachian, like it's, it's related to Romanian sort of Romanian traditions. Um, and these women are sort of outcasts from society, and uh, even today they live sort of in like little huts with like one leg or something. Like, like the hut itself is like on like a little pedestal and like it looks horrifying. Um, and uh, you know, you go on pilgrimage to find one, nobody will tell you where she lives. Uh, it's fascinating. And then if you need, you know, specific charms, um, if you want someone to fall in love with you, if you want to be protected from illness, if you want, you know, sort of the, the, the typical things that, that you want when you, when you go to, like, even a soothsayer. Um, she will make, uh, she, will, she will have you, like, she'll mix you up a special bottle of water, or um, she'll give you, like, a pouch with, with, um, with herbs that are supposed to achieve this goal. So that's what they have. They have from their local village, which... Um, it's not, I mean, I think that, that the sort of the, the pagan, the pagan aspects of like Vlaška Magia, black magic, like they're, they're, they're never condoned by the church, but so much of the rituals that are related to the Eastern Orthodox Church are rooted in, in pagan mysticism and pagan ritual that it's really hard to separate the two. Um, but yeah, thank you. You had a question. The significance of the Jungle Book. Um, I read the Jungle Book growing up. It was uh, it was the first book that I read for myself in Serbo-Croatian, and then the first book that I read for myself in English. Um, in the book, it was supposed to function only as a way for the grandfather, as a child, to understand what a tiger is, like just sort of the very basic concept of what is a tiger. Um, but then it, it took, a, took on a life of its own, and it, it sort of grew into this massive talisman between the grandfather and Natalia, and generations, and sort of this belief in the deathless man. Um, and that really wasn't planned, and that was a huge surprise to me that it ended up being so significant in, in the book. Thank you, thank you. I, I know, I realize that like the Jungle Book in, in, in the States isn't like a children's book that people read to their children. Um, it's more of sort of like, like a colonialist text. Uh, and I didn't, I didn't, like I didn't realize that. And when I when I brought the when I brought the uh, the novel in for workshop, they were like, "Man, you you got all these like this like heavy colonialist stuff with a jungle book here." And I was like, "Um, Mowgli? Like I don't." So it's strange. Thank you. Yes. Um, sure. Um. The 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 question is is what, sort of in relation to the rest of the 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 book and sort of the very complex and, and very stretched out timeline of, of Yugoslav. Um, history. Um, when, when is, Natalia is, is ocul, uh, blah, Natalia is inoculating the orphans um, probably around 2006, 2007. Um, the timeline, and I, I know this simply because at one point I got so confused with my own writing that I was like, I gotta figure out when these people are doing this. So I, um, I did a timeline for myself. So the grandfather was born in about 1932. So the stories together go from like, I mean, they don't go in chronological order, but this, the, the period covered is from 1932 to 2006, 2007. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, the Marshall, uh, any reference to the Marshall can definitely be construed. <laughs> 
Um, and uh, you know that was that was the the sort of like the the heyday of um, socialist Yugoslavia, which actually I guess functioned and um, you know put up a serious resistance to the uh, to the USSR and, and the Iron Curtain and that kind of thing. But um, but yeah, no, it, like the history itself is very complicated history. Complicated more by the fact that like the names in it are completely indecipherable unless you're like familiar with Slavic languages. <laughs> um, but yeah, I was deliberately ambiguous about where it happened and sort of when it happened because I didn't want to be bogged down in like very concrete history and I didn't really get into politics at all. I just wanted to see the narratives and, um, and see how people get through what I'm through fable. So yeah, thank you, thank you. Yes. Um, it, it translated sort of a lot closer than I would have thought or even was aware of while I was writing the book. And I think that's one of the surprising processes about how much of yourself you end up putting on the page without knowing it. Um, I think that the relationship between Natalia and her grandfather and the character of the grandfather is very closely modeled on her grandfather, sort of incidentally. Um, and, uh, and that was, you know, I mean, we used to, he was a very uh, moral man and sort of very fright. I mean, like he he stood at like like six foot four and was like terrifying to everybody around him. I mean, and, and he was a he actually was not a doctor. He was an aeronautical engineer. He built planes um, and and like supervised other people who built planes. Um, and uh, and we you know we had a we had a wonderful relationship that was based very much on storytelling and walking around. Um, and that sort of came out in the book as well. Um, I don't think that Natalia is very closely modeled on me, though. I, uh, I think that there's other characters who, who sort of bear the, the, the brunt of my compulsions and sort of fears and obsessions. Like, Darisha the Bear is a really good one, and I'm not joking. <laughs> Um, there's a lot of me in Darisha the Bear. I mean, I don't like turn into a bear or anything like, like after 12, but um, you know, it's the, the whole relationship to death and, and the, the fear of it and the sort of preventative kind of measures, like that, that's there. But um, so even though Nat I am not Natalia, um, Natalia's grandfather is very, very heavily modeled on my grandfather. I mean, it was, and it was cathartic. To, to write that way, and um, there were points like, I, I go to, I go to Serbia once a year, and uh, since finishing the book, I have never felt emotionally as close to my grandfather at his gravesite as I did while writing this book. Um, so that's that's got to be something. So yeah, thank you. So forty days after death. Yeah. Is that a typical tradition? Yeah. yeah. Um, I think that it is, but it's also like, um, but I heard about that tradition from my grandmother, who's Muslim. Um, so that's, a, I feel like that's probably also a shared pagan thing. The 40 days after death, like you're not supposed to, this isn't just, uh, it doesn't just apply to death. Like the idea of not, um, there's a finality to starting to move stuff around after somebody leaves you, whether that is, you know, the spiritual departure of a person who's died or the physical departure of somebody who's taken a one hour plane ride. Like I, when, when I leave Serbia and I you know, typically fly through Frankfurt and, and then to, to, to New York, um, I clean as much of the house as I can because I know my grandmother like won't, like she won't pick up anything. Like she won't make her bed uh, until she knows that I've, I've gotten to the other side. So there's this idea of, of the journey that's very, you're supposed to like light a candle emotionally for the people who are on any kind of journey. And for some reason, um, for, for the dead, that's 40 days. And uh, like somebody told me, and I don't know who it was, and I think it was a lie because I'm not, I'm not sure that that's true, that, um, that 40 days was the longest uh, anybody had been diagnosed as dead but had then woken up. Um, and I, somehow that doesn't fly with me. Like I don't think it's true, but... Uh, I don't know, like I, I have a feeling it like goes back to sort of European plague times and that whole like little bell ringing thing in the grave and, and stuff, like I, I'm not sure, but um, I bet it has something to do with that. But yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, yes? Can you tell us a little bit? Well, Richard Bear is, um, he's, he was actually in, in an original draft, in that short story uh, version, he was the only villain of the, of the book. 
And um, he was actually, like, he was not an outsider from, from the village um, in that draft at all. He was sort of a, a drunk in town who, who was designated to, to, to kill the tiger. But, I mean, in, in the book, he's, you know, he, his relationship to the village is that he sells furs um, and comes around once a year. And uh, this sort of, as this epic snow bogs the village in, which, you know, sort of goes hand in hand with the, with the um, moral and emotional hemming in that's happening as they're becoming obsessed with this tiger. He's the only person who appears from the outside and, and seems capable of, of taking care of their problem. Um, and his, uh, you know, his, his, I mean, like, he's somebody that the grandfather's a child very much admires, but as he becomes somebody who starts to hunt the tiger, the grandfather's, you know, alliance shifts away from this man he's admired all his life. I mean, I, I think that that's sort of part of growing up, that, that you, you know, realize that perhaps, and I mean, Thursday the Bear's just doing his job, like, he's a hunter, he has no real alliance there. But, um, you know, through the manipulation of, of the apothecary, he becomes, you know, this villain in the grandfather's eyes. And I think that the, the, point, of, the point of so many of the backstories was to sort of complicate the question of villainy. Um, and uh, so it's there for, for Luca, and it's there for Darisha and uh, the apothecary as well. Thank you. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, favorite author is, um, my absolute favorite book of all time is The Master and Margarita by Mikhail Bulgakov, which is like, I mean, <laughs> that's one of those books where, where like, I'm happy to have been born into a world where that book exists. You know what I mean? Like that's just, that's, mm. um, the uh, um, uh, Garcia Marquez, Love in the Time of Cholera, and 100 Years of Solitude, but sort of less so, I don't know why. Um, people sort of tend to ally themselves with one or the other. Um, I love uh, Isaac Dennison, Out of Africa and Shadows in the Grass. Um, Ernest Hemingway, I'm a huge fan of Hemingway's, especially his short stories. I feel like for dialogue, you, you can't beat him. Like, there's no... I remember being 16 and reading Hemingway and being like, I have no idea what's going on in this short story. Like, it's three pages long and I have no idea what's going on. And then as you sort of become sort of a more sentient being and you start to understand, like, like you realize the, the, the subtleties and, and um, how complex it is. And um, I love Flannery O'Connor too. I think she's wonderful. And what she does sort of, you're reading it here, but it's like, you're understanding it like here. If you really sort of like connect with the text, like what she's doing to your consciousness is like ridiculous. Um, so yeah, thank you. Those are those are just a few. They're sort of scattered. Thanks. If the silence goes for too long, I begin to sing, and I can't carry a tune in a bucket. So. No, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, one more question, I guess, because we are sort of winding. Yes. What happens to the tiger in the end? Um, I actually learned my lesson with this question. Um, <laughs> um, I'll tell you how that happened. Um, my first time reading um, was on, like, my first time reading in New York was like March 11th or something, and, and the book had come out March 8th. And somebody in the audience asked that question or something sort of very similar to it. And it, I didn't do the math and was not like, this is an audience full of people who have not finished this book. I mean, like, it was three days after the book had come out and that person was the only person in the audience. And I was like, I'll tell you. I like, went into this like 15 minute spiel about what happened to the tiger and uh, just sort of had to flee from the establishment like with my head covered. So um, I, I, I can tell you at, at the signing table, if you like. Um, but I suspect that there's probably people here who haven't read the book, and I, I can't like I can't do like an open like I would be very happy to answer your question. Cover your ears. I don't know. Like I'm sorry. Like okay, that's that's fine. Yeah, whoever would like that question answered can meet me out by the table. Um, but uh, but 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 I can't like I like I I feel like I I just like like I thank you thank you. Um, I guess. I'm